Good evening, everyone. Welcome to People's University live stream, Bugs and People. This is our entomology series. And tonight we'll be talking about Hymenoptera, which is a very popular order of insects that includes honeybees, bumblebees, and other things. I'll introduce our instructor for the evening in just a moment. I will remind you that if you ask a question tonight, you'll be entered in a drawing at the end. Tonight we're giving away two very nice prizes. One is a Blanco Glass Bee Suncatcher that you can hang in your garden. And the other is uh, the WWF allows you to adopt a honeybee and you'll get three plushy honeybees and a bag and some other uh, things and a little certificate that says you've adopted a honeybee to help them out. Uh, as most of you probably know, they're, they're having a little bit of trouble right now and have been for a few years. Um, we'll probably hear some more about that. Now, next Tuesday, uh, Archiving Wheeling presents The Lesser Known Legends of Wheeling. This is our series about wheeling people who deserve to be better known that you may, may or may not have heard of. And this will deal with Mabel Hall, who was a newspaper writer uh, who wrote during the segregation period in Wheeling about um, the uh, black population and, and social events. And the presenter is Emma Wiley, who works at Wheeling Heritage. Uh, so it will be both in person and live stream because we can do that at noon. Uh, we can't do these evening programs yet because of the library hours. Next Thursday on this channel, uh, Dr. Michael Strand from the University of Georgia will join us. His topic is mosquitoes. Uh, so they're not as, as cuddly as bees, but uh, it's an important program because we'll learn about controlling uh, mosquitoes and because they do transmit diseases and uh, some of the beneficial things they do as well. Okay, we are very pleased to have with us tonight the new president of West Liberty University. Uh, prior to accepting that position, Dr. W. Franklin Evans has served as president of Voorhees College in Denmark, South Carolina since 2016. He earned his PhD in higher education administration and supervision from Georgia State University in Atlanta and EDS in science curriculum and instruction from the same school, an MED in science curriculum and instruction, a BA in journalism and a BS in entomology, biology. He's published many articles in academic journals and delivered numerous presentations on the subject of executive leadership, black leadership and education. Here is Dr. Franklin Evans. Thank you. I'm excited uh, to be presenting tonight on a subject that uh, was one of my first loves. And so we're going to get right in uh, pollinators and stingers uh, talking tonight about the order Hymenoptera. And so I, I recognize that the audience might be varied. And so hopefully by the end of this session, I can at least speak and hold your attention by giving you just an overview, a survey of the order Hymenoptera. Hopefully not at, at, at either ends of the spectrum, but that it's information that you will find valuable or at least interesting. So for tonight, for this particular session, uh, we're going to identify the characteristics of the order Hymenoptera. Uh, distinguish between the two suborders of this order, one uh, being the uh, Symphyta, the other being the uh, Apocrita. And so we're going to distinguish between those two suborders. The next objective is that hopefully you'll be able to explain that whole process called pollination. It is important to, to the Hymenopterus, and so we're going to talk about that briefly. Additionally, describe the growth and reproduction patterns of ants, wasps, and bees. Discussing the socialization behavior of the order is also something that we will cover. That will be one of our objectives. And then to explore the impact of select insects on mankind, on, on, on life in general. So those are the objectives of tonight's session. So the order Hymenoptera, uh, just want you to know, it is one of the largest orders. Uh, there are more than 150,000 species. 
In fact, the order Hymenoptera, it actually appeared, as researchers say, some 200 million years ago. And if you're concerned about the name, the hymen part, it's Greek uh, for membrane. And the latter part of the word, uh, tura, is Greek for wing. So you put those together, you've got membrane, you've got wing. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But hymenopteras are abundant in most habitats, uh, whether we're talking about a, a tropical environmental climate, subtropical, even in the, the colder climates, you will find hymenopteras. Their mouth parts of, of these particular insects, or they are adaptable for chewing. Uh, some have a, a proboscis. In, in, in fact, the photo that I have there shows an elongated sucking mouthpiece that these insects use for drinking, especially for extracting nectar uh, from, from, from plants. These insects may be parasitic. Some are non-parasitic. Uh, a few can be uh, carnivorous, where they like meat, they, they love people, uh, other insects, or phytophagus, in, in which they are focused completely on plant life. And then you have some of the insects in, in this order are omnivorous, where they like meat as well as plants. The phytophagus ones, they feed on flowers, they feed on pollen, even foliage and, and stems of, of plants and, and flowers. But these particular insects will have an ovipositor, which is present for sawing, is present for piercing, or even stinging. And we will get into that a little later. There are some characteristics of this order of Hymenoptera. I, I mentioned its name signifies that there are uh, membranous wings. And so they have two pairs of membranous wings. In addition, the, the four wings, the, the first pair, uh, and the hind wings, they are actually joined by small hooks. And so the hind wings, as you see in the illustration on the slide, are much smaller than the four wings. Now, some insects that belong in this order, you may not see any wings being present. And so several uh, species, certain insects in the order might not have wings that are present in some species. And we'll talk about the ants because that's one of the ones that come to mind. But the Hymenoptera order, these insects have large compound eyes, eyes that are very visible. And they have chewing mandibulate mouthpieces. Their mouth parts are able to chew. You will notice that with these insects, they have legs that have articulated segments. Uh, most will have at least five to six segments that separates them from other orders of, of insects. These particular insects of this order will undergo complete metamorphosis. They will go from uh, eggs being hatched to larvae being formed to pupa being uh, in, in, encrusted in, in, in a shell, and then they will become adults. And we'll talk about that a little later as well. But those are some of the characteristics of the Hymenoptera. I mentioned that there were two suborders uh, of these particular insects. One suborder uh, is the uh, Symphyta. And, and let me say it up front that I'm going to probably use a couple of pronunciations of the word and I will use them interchangeably. Uh, it's like people who say envelope or envelope or Andrea or Andrea. So I, I will say some phyta is, is certainly one pronunciation of the word. Uh, others might say symphida, but the symphida or symphida uh, suborder includes the sawflies and the horn tails. Those are the uh, insects that fall within that particular suborder. The second suborder of Hymenoptera is the ap Apocrita or Apocrita. And it includes the ants, bees, and the wasps. If we look very carefully at the suborder uh, Symphata, uh, which as I said, 
includes the horn tails and the saw flies, it has a body without a waist. The example that I have at the, the, the far upper right corner shows you how that body of the, of the insect does not include the, the segmented waist. So, so you don't see a waist uh, in, in, in these insects. The, the female will have an ovipositor for laying eggs. As you can, can look and, and, and see the, the instrument that's coming from the abdomen, it's saw-like in appearance and it's able to cut into plants in order to lay its eggs. The larvae of this particular uh, suborder are caterpillar-like. Uh, and I, we contrast that to larvae that looks like maggots, but here with uh, Symphata, the, the larva is like a caterpillar. It has legs and also chewing mouth parts that make it somewhat unique. And these particular insects, as I mentioned earlier, are uh, phytophagous. They feed on tissue by burrowing into plants or into wood. I know that's an interesting concept, but that's what the uh, some phyta group that that's what they do. Now the other suborder, uh, Apocrita, it includes wasps, the bees, and ants. Mentioned that the uh, symphyta, there is no distinct waste. But if you look at our example here with, with this particular uh, wasp, you'll see that there, the body has a distinct waste. It's very profound. Uh, and, 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 and so when you look at that, you will notice that the uh, peti petiole, it, 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 it joins the thorax and the abdomen. And so that's that thin little waste there. Uh, the patoli. And the larva for this particular group, they are maggot-like. So you won't find the legs. Uh, once the egg hatches and develops into the larva, you won't see uh, the caterpillar look. It'll just be like maggots, a lot like the, the flies. But these particular insects have a wide range of eating habits, a wide range. And, and, and so it's, you, you can't pinpoint because they, 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 they differ. Most of the insects uh, of this suborder are solitary, but others are organized in social communities of varying sizes and complexities. And we're gonna talk about those communities. And so you can see that this suborder with wasps, bees, and ants Really, there's a lot of diversity there. So let's talk about the life cycle and, and growth. I said to you earlier that uh, these insects have complete metamorphosis. And so they go through the four distinct stages of an egg. Uh, egg being laid, uh, that egg grows into a larva. Uh, eventually, the, the larva uh, becomes a, a, a pupa and is in its cocoon. And ultimately, an adult will emerge. So these insects in the order Hymenoptera certainly go through all four distinct stages. Sex is determined by the fertilization of eggs. And so to if you wanted to know whether it's going to be a male or a female insect, it's, it's based on how the egg is fertilized or if it's fertilized. And the queen controls the fertilization process. Let me say that again. You're going to hear this uh, throughout the presentation that the females are more specifically, it is the queen who controls the fertilization process. So you will see with some of these insects that the male and female species have major differences. Uh, often in size, uh, that the, the male may be larger or, or, or smaller, depending on, on which insect we're talking about. So there will be some different appearances in these species. The females do essentially the work of the society, the work of the hive, the work of the colony. The females are the workers. And uh, again, you're going to hear that, that particular phrase uh, will be repeated throughout the presentation as well. But these insects have a sophisticated communication system. They know how to communicate with one another and they do it effortlessly. Bees, ants, and, and wasps, they have chemoreceptors uh, for taste and smell. Uh, they have a keen sense of, of smell as small as these insects are. Uh, those 
uh, chemoreceptors allow them to not only smell, but, but to taste as well. I have to talk about the pollination process because uh, as this topic says, pollinators and stingers, the pollination process is extremely important. So when you see an insect, a bee or a wasp that's uh, on a plant, they're not just there smelling the flower, uh, they are involved in the pollination process. And so pollination occurs when pollen is moved within flowers or created from a carrot from one flower to another flower by pollinating animals or, or insects. Birds do it, bees do it, bats do it, butterflies, moths, beetles, and even other animals. And sometimes the wind aids in the pollination process. So the transfer of pollen in and between flowers of the same species leads to fertilization and successful seed and fruit production of plants. Pollin pollination ensures that a plant will produce full-bodied fruit at a full set of viable seeds. And so uh, pollination occurs either via self-pollination, which uh, occurs within a flower, where the, the pollen is, is just moved around in that particular flower or cross-pollination where the process occurs between flowers. So you've got uh, bees, for example, that are at one plant or uh, one flower and they're moving to another. And by that movement, cross-pollination takes place. Worldwide, roughly a thousand plants grown for food, beverages, fiber, spices, even medicines are a result of pollination by, by insects and animals. And, and it's needed to produce the goods that we as humans depend upon. So foods and beverages such as apples and berries, chocolate, uh, coffee, e even melons, peaches, potatoes, vanilla, almonds, and tequila are all produced as a result of pollination. In the United States alone, it is a big business. And so pollination of, of, of bees and other insects produces over $40 billion worth of products each year. So I hope you can see that pollination really is an important process. So how does it work? This, this is a, a, a simple process to tell you. First, the, the bees will visit a flower to, connect the, to collect nectar, and, and when that bee is there, the, the pollen sticks to, to, to the bee, it, it sticks to them. And so as the, the bee moves all over the plant, that particular flower, that's the self-pollination that could occur. Often though, the bee is going to fly away. And when that bee flies away, it's going to carry with it pollen that is still stuck to its body. So when it lands on another flower of the same type, it's bringing that, that pollen from the first flower with it. And so the pollination of the second flower, uh, it, it, it occurs. And so you have fertilization and reproduction. Uh, I, I know I simplified it for you, but that is actually what happens and how the bees in particular are very good at helping with pollination. So what are some of the benefits to, to mankind when we talk about pollination? Well, active pollination of plants ensures the proper development of fruits and vegetables that we use, that we depend upon. And, and so plants, there are plants that cannot reproduce unless insects intervene and, and, and help to pollinate those particular plants. The other thing about insects is that they are helpful in being parasites and predators of pest insects. The hymenopterus play a, a major role in, in being parasites, that uh, these insects will actually lay their eggs inside of another insect. And, and that egg will, will grow and develop and will feed off of other insects. And so it really, that there's this balance that the hymenopterans exert uh, and it's somewhat profound but subtle at the same time in controlling the population of other insects and anthropods in our environment. So there are benefits to mankind. 
Well, I, I want to talk about some select hymenopterans. I, 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 I'm going to focus on some of my favorites and, and, and some that you will uh, probably come in contact with uh, more frequently than others. And so WASP, uh, that's first on my list. <laughs> you may not know this, but there are over 400 species of social and solitary wasps. Yeah, and, and so the, the social wasps include yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps, and, 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 and these are insects and social wasps that have paper-like nests, and, and we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. It's the females, and all females born have the capacity, the capability of becoming a queen, of becoming the queen, and we'll talk about that momentarily. The females lay eggs frequently. They, they do it very often and they compete with rivals to be most dominant. So the, the process of, of becoming the queen is that there are other females who, who have the potential of being queen, but the most dominant female is going to be the queen. And, and so a, a part of the process is that the females have to lay eggs. And so you may have a, a, a female insect that is laying a, a lot of eggs in, in comparison and competition with other females. And so that particular female as she's laying eggs may go and eat the eggs of some of the other females. That's a part of, of, of this rivaling process. And so whichever female uh, emerges as the, the strongest, the dominant one, that's the female that becomes queen of the group. Stinging wasps are the predators, and they use their ovipositor to, to sting not only people, but even other insects and feed upon them. Dark moving objects, I'm told, are, are often, uh, when, they, when, when wasps see the, the, a, a dark object that's moving, it causes some alarm with them, and they have a tendency to want to react. And, and, and sometimes, they attack. I failed to mention that wasps belong to the family uh, Vespidae, a Vespidae, uh, but that's uh, the, the family under the order Vespidae uh, is where wasps are categorized and classified. So yellow jackets. Uh, yellow jackets mostly have underground nests. Uh, you are familiar with the, the, the yellow jacket. Uh, they are the ones that fold their wings longitudinally at rest. As the example at the bottom of the slide shows you, uh, you can know it's a yellow jacket because their wings are, are going to be longitudinal when, when they're not moving. The abdomen of the yellow jacket, of course, is black and yellow. That's it's the name, yellow jacket. The, the jacket of the, of the insect is, is yellow, black and yellow. These insects are slow to sting unless they are threatened. I know some of you would say, no, they're always moving. They're always active, even when, when I'm not doing anything. But, but generally, they are, are, are slow to sting. But once they feel threatened, then they are going to react so that any vibrations near the nest can stimulate alarm on their part and ultimately attacks. They are very active. Yellow jackets are extremely active in warm weather on sunny days. And sweet smelling perfumes or, or hairspray can irritate and cause alarm on their parts. And so if you, you're one of those individuals that wear a lot of uh, perfume or colognes and you're out, yellow jackets may find you because the odor that you, you are giving off is certainly causing some alarm for them. So here's the, uh, the yellow jacket. The yellow jacket has a stinger that pierces the skin and injects venom. The interesting thing about the yellow jacket is that it does not leave its stinger behind. What does that mean? That means that a yellow jacket can sting multiple times. They are meat eating predators and they are attracted to sugars and proteins. I know you've been out uh, in a picnic area where there might be garbage left or while you're out there dining and, and, and having a good time where you've got 
uh, punch and, 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 and drinks, syrupy drinks and, and sweets and, and all those things. And all of a sudden you see yellow jackets. That's because the sugars and they have a keen sense of smell. They are attracted and that's why they come. But I want you to know that yellow jackets are provoked by smoke. Uh, and, and so if you're trying to smoke them out, you're only causing problems. And by no means, don't start shooing them away because when you're shooing them away and, and hitting, all you're doing is aggravating them. Because the thing that the yellow jacket does is once they are, are aggravated, uh, they, they will send the, the signal out to other yellow jackets and then you will have them joining in for the attack. So keep that in mind. But the other thing is that the stinger isn't left behind, which means that yellow jackets can sting over and over again. If we look specifically at the hornets and, and, and the wasp, and I, I'll start with the, the hornets. Uh, the hornets at the, at the bottom of, of, of the slide, you will see they're brown with yellow stripes on them, yellow stripes on, on their abdomen. Hornets have a, a, a pale face. <laughs> I know you're probably saying, I'm not going to get that close to, to, to see what kind of face that, that hornet has, but it really is pale in comparison to other insects and, and other parts of the body. Hornets, um, they create paper nests uh, that, 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 that are brown. Their mandibles are, are, are allow them to chew, chew uh, not just plants, but even wooden objects so that as they, uh, as they digest this, they're able to uh, use paper and create a nest that's, that's brown in, in color. Their nests are found in hollow trees, in barns, uh, hollow exterior walls of, uh, of your home, or even in attics you will find hornets setting up a, a shop there. Now, paper wasps are those wasps that are much more common uh, to everyday life. These insects are reddish brown in color. Uh, they have a mark on their head, on their thorax, even on their abdomen. Uh, their nests are umbrella-like and, and, and made of, of paper. Uh, the example at the top right corner, you've seen those nests all around you. And so generally that's a, a, a paper wasp. And these are the, the nests that hang from branches, from the ceiling, from floors or, or roof joints, uh, paper wasp. And if the nest is disturbed, aggressiveness from these wasps will, will occur. And so I know when you, you ha you're tempted, when you see the, the nest there uh, that might be on your porch or in the backyard, you want to, you want to do something to it. So once you, if you're going to do something, be very careful because once the nest is disturbed, you're going to see that the wasps will show a level of aggressiveness. What I've, I've, I've provided on this slide is about the, going back to the hornets, that they have a stinger and that they can sting multiple times, that the venom of a, of a hornet contains a histamine that, that can trigger severe allergic reactions. And particularly those people who are allergic to, to wasps and insects, those hornets can again sting you multiple times. And so in addition to having a swollen hand or a swollen leg, Individuals may develop other severe allergic reactions to a, a hornet sting. I, I talked about uh, some insects being social, and, and, and I wanted to make sure you understood what so the socialization of, of these insects are. Are they social or are they solitary? And so you're probably saying, well, what is the difference? Well, social insects or eusocial insects, they live in a, in, in a caste system with various levels. So there, there's a system where there's a queen, there, there, there are soldiers, there, there are workers, etc. So being the social insects, they are part of a caste system. Social insects depend on the rest of the colony for survival. So there is this interrelatedness of the insects in the group. They, they, they depend on one of one another in order to survive. So, so it, it, 
Let me give you the three characteristics of social insects so, so that you, you will know. First, they must live together in, in a group and in a group of varying generations. So often with, with hymenopterus, you will have uh, the queen and you've got eggs, you've got larvae, you've got pupil, th then you've got young adults. And those young adults also will be surrounded by another group of adults that were there before them and even some other adults. And, and so there might be generations of of uh, insects in a particular hive, in a particular colony. So they must live together in a group of varying generations. The second characteristics of social insects is the adults in the group care for the young, whether it's their own young, well, brothers and sisters, because there are generations, the adults take on a responsibility of caring for the for the eggs, for the for the larva, e even for the, the pupa. And, and so cooperative brood care is what takes place with those social insects. And then the third thing is that the group has uh, uh, that the, the, there is a caste system. I mentioned that. And, and so, yes. There, there really is um, a, a separation of, of, of duties and, and responsibility, a, a division of labor, so that people have specific jobs that they're supposed to do. And that's what uh, social insects, those are the three characteristics of social insects. So, well, what's solitary insects? Glad you asked the question. Solitary insects, they live on their own, except to mate. <laughs> Sex is obviously a, an, an important aspect of their lives, but solitary insects, for the most part, live alone. They, and the most common solitary insect is the wasp. These insects seek out food and shelter without the assistance from others. They don't need to be in, in large groups. They don't need to be in, in, in gangs or packs. They are individuals that, that operate on their own. So their offspring, once formed, will lead and establish their own nest. So when you're creating, cultivating uh, the new offsprings, once they become adults, they leave, they go, they leave home and don't come back. They go and find their own home. I know some uh, parents, uh, some, some human parents wish that their kids would do that. But when it comes to the, the solitary insects, that is something that they do. The example at the top of, of this of this of the slide is the mud dauber. The mud dauber is a prime example of a solitary wasp because the mud dauber makes his own nest, or they make a singular nest, and, and they go in and, and do all the work. Uh, but you don't. They don't have these these large communities, these large colonies, or a large hive. And, and so this is a prime example of a solitary insect. Well, let me get to one of those groups of uh, hymenopterus, particularly in the suborder uh, Apocrita, that is of interest, and that is ants. <laughs> that is ants. And so uh, the ants belong to the uh, Formicidae family, the family of Formicidae. And, and so it includes uh, carpenter ants, uh, but these are social insects because they work closely together. They use teamwork to survive. They use teamwork to find food, to raise young, and to maintain the colony. It's seldom that you, you see one ant. When you see one ant, there are others to, to, to follow. And so ants are social insects. The carpenter ant is uh, brownish black. It squirts uh, formic acid. And so when you come in contact with ants, you know, they, they, they sting. It's because it is the, the, uh, the formic acid that they are, are, are punishing you with. These ants live off of dead insects and carbohydrates. And so they, they are, they are eating, um, uh, animals, carbohydrates. They can infest your home. Uh, and even wooden items. And if you're not careful and you, you have to look, you, you will find your house with, with, with ants. Generally, they are the carpenter ants. Uh, 
those brownish black ants. And then uh, and for those of you who are gardeners and you have the, the, the black ants out in your, in your garden, those are, are, are black ants that, and that, are, that are garden ants. And then if you uh, travel out in the woods and, and, and you see uh, these other mounds, large mounds, there's the wood ant, which is found in forests, in woods, uh, under leaves, under branches, and so those large mounds of, of, of ants that could even get up to uh, one and two feet high are those wood ants. Ants uh, in, in the summertime will have wings. And I know some of you are saying, what? Uh, those are termites, no, ants. And it occurs for what's known as uh, nuptial flight, where young queens are, are being fertilized through this process. And once it happens, uh, they've got wings. The, the 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 females, the queens, young queens, even the the the, the male ants. Uh, but once they bait in in flight, the queen will break off her wing. Uh, she'll she'll <laughs> she she she'll she'll start laying eggs. Uh, and 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 she can actually lay eggs up to twelve years. She will pull the wings off of the male. And once the mating has taken place, I've got bad news for you. The male dies. The, the, the male, and after he has, has, has done his business, helped to, <laughs> to, to mate with the, with the queen, and, and, and she has uh, torn off her wings and his wings, uh, he's going to die. His, his, the, the lifespan is, 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 not, is not long at all. The other thing, so fire ants, I, I, I would be remiss if I, I didn't talk about fire ants because uh, they are predators. They are certainly reddish brown ants uh, with two uh, patellar nods between the thorax and the abdomen. That's how you can recognize a fire ants because between the, uh, the, the, the thorax and the, the, and, and the abdomen, you're going to find these two, those two, nodes that are there and, and and they're right on each other that lets you know you're dealing with fire ants and of course they they are red these ants will sting and they will bite you sting and bite they have underground nests with a with a, a, a small mound and, and and sometimes before you realize it you you might be uh, in contact with fire ants so the male fire ants mates with the, the queen doing the, 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 the nuptial flight. And after he has successfully uh, inseminated the queen, they won't let him back into the colony. So uh, with, with ants in general, uh, the male is going to die once the mating takes place. But with fire ants, once the mating has taken place, they don't even let him back into the colony. So he's going to die. He has to die outside of the nest. Isn't that horrible? But that's what the ants do. Fire ants are uh, omnivorous. Uh, they'll eat anything, anything. Uh, so they sustain themselves mostly on plants and, and, and seeds, but they also will feed and feast upon small animals as well. Uh, occasionally, a, a, a small animal will mistakenly find himself on a a fire ant mound, and, and those ants will come out immediately and attack. Fire ants cause approximately $750 million in damage each year to agricultural assets, including uh, veterinarian bills uh, because uh, they've attacked some, some, some animal and, and now it has to go to the vet for, for treatment, livestock, uh, but 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 even e when we're talking about the, these fire ants, they are deadly, uh, problematic, and uh, they even will have an effect on the crops and the productions of, of, of crops. So fire ants cost a lot of money, uh, a lot of harm, uh, and and for something so small, they might be small in stature, but they are. They are problematic in a big way, fire ants. So when you look at the fire ants, a lot like wasps, a lot like hornets, 
Fire ants can sting multiple times. They have the ability to survive in extreme conditions, whether it's extremely hot or even in the cold weather, fire ants will survive. They can handle the extreme conditions. They are resilient to floods uh, coming from the South and, and, and there are hurricanes and you would think that with the hurricanes and the flooding occurs that it would at least wash away the fire ants. No, they remain, they, they are resilient to, to floods. And, and the thing about fire ants is that they bite you just to grip you. And once they grip you, that's when they sting. And they sting with a toxic alkaloid venom. Uh, and, and you will find the nest of fire ants uh, at riverbanks, on riverbanks, uh, pond shores, even watered lawns. If, if you're one of those people that uh, frequently water your, your, your lawn and, and, and your lawn is moist, don't be surprised if you don't have an infestation of fire ants there. And these colonies can be uh, polygonous where there are multiple queens because the underground colony is so large with, with, with tunnels. And even when on top the mound, you, you might try to destroy them. 40% of, of the colony is underground in these tunnels. And so there might be a queen on the, 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 the east part of the, of the colony, a, a, another queen in the, the, the west or the northern part. So with fire ants, there might be multiple queens and, and that's rare. Uh, with fire ants as opposed to other insects uh, in the hymenoptera order. Now I want to focus on bees. Uh, one of my, my favorite <laughs> my favorite groups. Uh, here, the, the bumblebee. The bumblebee, you know it's a bumblebee because it's black and yellow in color. The bees are a part of the apidae, uh, or apidae family. Bees, uh, all bees fall under the apidae family. I, so the bumblebee is black and yellow in, in color. You, you know that it, it, it's, its body is a thick and it's fuzzy all over. Uh, bumblebees are fuzzy all over with short, stubby wings. Uh, they are easily recognizable. They have nests in the ground. They, they build their nests in the ground. They eat nectar and pollen made by flowers. You will see that bumblebees are always around the, the flowers because they're eating the nectar and they are taking the, the, the pollen that's, that, that's there as well. The wings of a bumblebee beats 130 times per second. And I mentioned that because when they are around the, the flowers, they, they're vibrating so much until the pollen is actually released. So that's the good thing. It's almost like, like humming bee, humming birds, but bumblebees do the same thing that when they're uh, near the flower by their wings vibrating so fast, they are actually releasing pollen from that particular flower. A bumblebee colony uh, will die in the late fall. Uh, and and the, the, the colony would just die out every fall with the exception of the queen. The queen hibernates during the winter underground. Uh, all the other bees will die out, but she will hibernate, remain there. And when the spring comes, she will start a new colony. Yes. So after hibernation, the queen, she comes out, she, she goes and finds food. She, she chooses the location for the next nest. She will lay eggs. She has already stored up food for herself and for the young that she's going to produce. And she feeds once, and once she's laid the eggs and the eggs become larvae, she feeds pollen to the larvae. And once those bees hatch, it's those bees that now become the, the worker bees to help her and to guard the nest to find food for her and take care of the next batch of eggs. Because remember, she's laying thousands of eggs. And so the, 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 the newly hatched bees now become worker bees to assist the queen. The other thing I wanted to tell you about bumblebees, I, I remember as a youngster taking the water hose when I saw the bumblebees and, and trying to spray them, thinking it would, it would just immobilize them, knock them out. Bumblebees are covered with an oil that makes them waterproof. They're not bothered by the water at all. They, they, they can survive water. So don't fool yourself. Uh, they're, 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 the bee is covered with an oil that makes them waterproof. 
Honeybees, still a part of the Apod family. Uh, honeybees, as you know, are, have golden brown abdomens with three to four transverse dark bands on them. Uh, it's the the females are the workers. They are the worker bees, and their job is to collect pollen and and, and nectar. That's what the worker bees do. The drones, that's the male. Their function is to fertilize young queen bees. That's it. The drone, the male bees only have the function to fertilize young queen bees. Honeybees are the only insects that produce foods for humans to eat. The only insect. That's why honeybees are so important. The only insect that produces food, honey, that humans will eat and consume. Honeybees are responsible for pollinating 80% of all vegetables uh, that, that we have. Honeybees do. And as I mentioned, the, the role of the queen, a honeybee queen will lay about 1,500 eggs each day. And honeybees, they have a dance-like movement. When you see the, the, the bee out there that looks like it's dancing, that dance is actually a form of communicating communicating information from that bee to other bees about the next location, distance, quality, and quantity of food. And so that's how they communicate through their dance patterns. I'm showing you, I mentioned to you that, uh, that even with a particular species of, of insects, that the male and female they may have different appearances different sizes. So the honeybee, and I, I've, I've got three examples here. On the, on the left side is an example of the worker bee. That's what the worker bee looks like. That's, those are the females. In the center is the queen, the queen honeybee, which is much larger. Notice that a larger abdomen, she is significantly larger than, than the, the other females. And then to the right is a picture of the drone, the male bee who is, it's robust, not as long as the queen, uh, but the that's the drone. And so you can tell that the male bee drones are much larger than the female worker bees. The queen produces uh, pheromones that control and organize the behaviors of the colony. And, and, and so each queen has a distinct uh, pheromone profile. And, and so because of that, that, that scent, the colony recognize who she is. And, and, and because of that, they are able to defend her and meet the needs because that profile registers and resonates with them. A newly hatched queen begins her life in a duel to the death with any other queens present in the colony and must destroy potential rivals that have not yet hatched. With honeybees, unlike fire ants, there can't be multiple queens. One queen, one queen controls the, the colony. And so when a new queen hatches right off the bat, uh, recognizes that she has to make sure that she is the only one. And so if there is another, they will fight until one is declared the winner and is able to control that the colony. And once she accomplishes this, she will take her virgin mating flight. Yes, that's what, what she will do. So throughout her life, she lays eggs and she secretes a pheromone that, that, that works to keep all other females in the colony sterile. That's very important. And so maintaining, maintaining proper temperature for the hive is, is very crucial for the survival of, of, of legs and the production of, of other honeybees. And so the brood chamber for the bees it has to remain at a steady temperature in order for the eggs to be incubated. And, and so if it's too hot, the, the worker bees will go out and collect water and will come and deposit the, the water around the hive. And then they're going to fan their wings in order to cool down uh, the, the, the colony through evaporation. If it's too cold, what the worker bees do, they will cluster together in order to generate body heat so that the temperature of the hive is remained constant. That's what the honeybee does. The stinger, uh, for those of you, you, you know about honeybees, well, they, they make honey, they're wonderful, but they will sting you. Uh, the stinger for the honeybee is, is barbed and it's connected to a venom sac. 
With honeybees, the stinger will be dislodged in the stingy or in the skin. There is just one sting per bee. Unlike wasps, unlike ants, honeybees can only, that one bee can only sting one time, one time. And so we'll talk about the colony. A honeybee colony will consist of a single queen. There might be a hundred uh, drones and, and thousands of worker bees. And, 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 and so in that colony, you're going to have egg and, and, and larvae and pupa and, and, and other adults, generations of, of that in the colony. And so a colony could have some 80,000 bees during an active season. Uh, and, and the worker bees, the females are out getting food and, and they're storing up honey for, for winter and, and, and building the, the comb and stuff. Over as the summer declines and we move into fall and winter, the bee production is going to decline. And so during the colder months, you're not going to have as, as, as many bees. Uh, when the, they die off, uh, a lot bees are not going to be produced during the, the, the colder seasons. So queens are the only member of the, of the colony that's able to lay uh, fertilized eggs. And, and, and the queen, she mates early in life, stows up millions of sperm within her body, and they're capable of living up to five years. Uh, but generally, they are only producing eggs for two or three. But can you imagine that one time you're collecting sperm that's going to last that long? Amazing. So the worker honeybees are the largest population of bees in the colony. Worker bees are, are entirely females. Remember, the worker bees are females. The males are drone. But they cannot produce fertilized eggs. But they can use their barbed stingers to defend the colony. And they do. But after attacking, as I said, the, the, the barbed stinger attaches to the, the victim and, and, it, and it really just tears the bee's abdomen. And so uh, the bee is going to die. That one sting that they're giving up, the bee is giving up his, her life for the colony. And, and so the, the workers are, are, are members uh, of the, they are the essential members of the colony. Uh, they forage for, uh, for, they, for pollen, for nectar, uh, and, and they take care of the queens, even the drones. They feed the larvae, they ventilate the hive, they defend the nest, uh, they preserve the survival of the colony. The, the worker bees, those female bees, they do, it, they do it all. And the average lifespan of a worker bee is only six weeks, six weeks. Drones are the, are the male honeybees. They have that one task, I told you before, one task. That's to fertilize new queens. Drones, they mate outdoors in the midair. And once they mate, they die. They die. Isn't that something? So swarming, I, you see the picture at, at the top of this slide. I, I wanted to talk about swarming. It's a natural process uh, in a developing colony. Honeybees swarm as a result of overcrowdedness within the hive. And, and, and so to create a swarm, the, the old queen leaves the hive. It's usually the old queen that leaves. And when she leaves the hive, she takes with her a, a large portion of, of the worker bees. Now, she's leaving the, the, the hive of the colony, but there is a new queen that remains there in the hive to carry on. And, and, and now she becomes the, the new ruler. But the, the old queen leaves. And so that swarm can contain thousands of worker bees and that one queen, that one single queen. And so the swarming bees will fly temporarily and they will cluster on a, on a shrub or on a, a tree branch and will stay there. That cluster will stay there for, 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 for many hours, even a, a few days, uh, depending on the weather conditions. And so it's giving the bees time in order to search for a new nesting site, a new location. And so when the scout bee or the scout bees make that determination, it's communicated to the bees and the cluster will immediately fly to the new site and set up shop. So when you see swarming, that's because they separated from, from, from a hive. Cannot end this discussion without talking about the Africanized 
killer bees. You know all about that. You've heard of those some years ago. Uh, dangerous stinging insects. They've been known to chase people for a quarter of a mile. Once they get excited, once they get aggravated, once they become aggressive, they will follow you. They will track you down. That's why they got the name, these bees, of, of being killer bees. Because uh, you can't get away from them. You just can't run a, a couple of yards and think that they're through. No, they will follow you quarter of a mile. And, and they look a lot like the domestic honeybees that we have. And in fact, the only way to, to really tell them apart is when you get them and, and you measure them. Uh, the, the Africanized bees are much smaller than the domestic honeybees that we have here. The Africanized bees, they, they are golden yellow with, with darker bands of brown on, on, on their abdomen. The example at the top shows you, that's the, uh, uh, a picture, an illustration of the African Africanized killer bees. They have small colonies, so they can build their nests in unique places. Unlike regular uh, honeybees or domestic honeybees, these Africanized killer bees have been known to live in trees and crates, um, uh, water meter boxes at your home, tree limb, utility poles, junk piles, holes in the ground, even your mailbox. If you've gone away for a period of time and your mail hasn't been checked, you come back, Africanized bees may have set up shop right there, overturned flower pots and empty cars. All of these spots are prime locations or accidental run-in with unsuspecting, unsuspecting people or animals. You, 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 you go to an old car, open it up, and then there you see bees, these Africanized killer bees that are there. The Africanized killer bee venom is no more dangerous than regular honeybees. A lot of people think that the venom of the killer bees is, is worse. No, that's not the problem. Their bees, the, the, the venom is similar to regular bees. But with the Africanized killer bees, they don't, one bee just won't attack you. They attack in greater number. And so that causes the problem. Unlike regular honeybees that one might attack you with the Africanized killer bees, if you, you've upset the, the, the nest and, or, or you've angered them, the aggressive bee is not by himself. They come in gangs. They come in packs. And so the, the difficulty is that when you upset one, the larger group comes to the rescue and will attack you. I failed to mention that these Africanized killer bees are a hybrid of two bee, bee species, one from Southern Africa, the other from South America. They have their own specific characteristics, but they are the Africanized killer bee. Wow, I know I've said a talk about a lot, but let, let's recap some things. Uh, the orders of Hymenoptera, there are two suborders. Uh, Symphata, which includes the, the soft flies and horn tails, uh, uh, Apocrita, which is the ants, bees, and, and, and the wasps. These are some of nature's most vicious stingers, but they also are vital pollinators of, of flowering plants and, and vegetables. The order Hymenoptera is the third largest order. And of course, it not only includes the ants, the bees, and wasps, but also horn tails and saw flies. The female species are the ones with the stingers or the ov ovipositors, and it can serve as a dual role, not only for laying eggs, but for stinging you. The ovipositor has a dual role, laying eggs, but also stinging. Saw flies and horn tails have a thicker body without a waist. And of course, you know that it's the uh, Apocrita that has the, the, the smaller waist, a defined waist. Uh, ant, bees, and wasps have species that are social and solitary. And I told you social means they have those three characteristics. Solitary means they kind of do things on their own. All female wasps are capable of becoming queens, but it's the female uh, who, de who develops from the fertilized eggs. Males develop because they are unfertilized. Keep that in mind. The females are the ones who control the regulation of sex ratio. They determine which eggs are going to be female, which are going to be male, because which are the ones I'm going to fertilize. They have that in their control. 
Insects have a structured community, a structured system of, of communication, a structured system of, of, of development. That's the thing about Hymenoptera. They are structured, structured colonies. Hymenopterans, they are the pollinators and they are the stingers, kind of a two-edged sword. They have the, the, the benefits of pollination, but they also have the, the negative aspect of stinging you and hurting you. Well, in a nutshell, that's the overview of the order Hymenoptera. Any final thoughts or questions? Wow, that was a lot of information, very well presented. Uh, yeah, um, we do have uh, several questions. So let, I'm gonna start from the, the most recent question and work backwards this time. Uh, one person asks, why are there so many different colors of honey? And, and, and so that's dependent on the, the, the pollen, the types of plants that they're, they're getting the, the that's using that's being used to come in and, and feed the larvae and stuff. Uh, and, and so depending on where you are, uh, wherever the plant, the plant and foliage is plentiful there, that will determine the color of the honey. Yeah, I see uh, at the coffee shop they have wildfire, wildflower honey from the local uh, bees. Yes. And uh, it, it's quite good. I've tried it. Um, okay, here's another question. <laughs> it's obvious that, that bees are invaluable as, as pollinators. Uh, do ants have any value? Of course they do. Uh, I know of, of, of cultures that eat ants and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so uh, I, I guess that's value. But also ants do serve a, a purpose in helping to get rid of, you know, they are predators. And, and so they add this balance uh, in nature of getting rid of some other, other, other insects. Uh, so the ants themselves are, are predators. But because of, of, of their stinger and the things that they do, they, they, they certainly uh, aid in, in keeping a balance of other insects here in our environment. OK, here's another question that I actually asked first, but we'll give it to Barb. They they so so the hornets, yes, they they are uh are, are similar, but, but the, the only difference is when you're talking about the, the killer bees, remember the killer bee, once it stings you that, that, that one time, that bee is done. But with the, the, with the hornets over and over, that, that, that stinger doesn't leave. And, and so in essence, can, can those hornets can, in my opinion, be, provide even a greater risk and, and damage because after they've stung you once, they don't just go away and die. They come back for a second or a third one, a third try or attempt. They're scary. Um, okay, here's a question about, uh, about your interest. <laughs> so I was, I was pre-med bound and uh, went to college to, to, to be a medical doctor. And it, the, the time and energy, four years, uh, getting a degree and then going off to med school for four years, I, I, I thought, oh gosh, that's I, I can't do it. I did not want to give up the, the coursework I, I had. And so my focus was really medical entomology and those insects that cause disease. Uh, and, and, and it was my intent to, so I, I've got a degree in entomology, a degree in journalism. I really wanted to work for CDC as a public information officer to talk about malaria, to travel and be a spokesperson, but it did not work out that way. But that's how I got my interest. I had my own bees. I was I was uh, <laughs> raising bees and, and honey. Uh, no one would have would have imagined it. And and so now when I, people hear about us, someone says, you know, he was an entomologist. People laugh because they can't picture me in any kind of dealing with bees or any kind of suit on. Uh, but that's how I got into it. Yeah, and when I saw that you were into it, when I, I read the press release about you being hired, I said, I have to ask him to teach. 
So here you are. Here's another question from Gene. No, uh, the the drones cannot. But but the 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 thing about the drones is because they're so big, uh, they do have man, the the bannables, and so they could actually uh, they don't sting, but but it, it 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 gives you the impression. And sometimes because you see a bee, if it lands on you, and even if it just scratches you, you you you, you think that oh my God, I've been stung, I've been stung. But no, they do not have a stinger. Uh, and, and some of it is just psychological, but they move around and 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 give the impression that they can do something, but no, they, they cannot. Here's a question from Maine. What is the, the best flowers to attract honeybees? Now that's a good question. It, it, it depends on, on where you are uh, because some flowers are not plentiful in, in, in other regions. And so as we were talking about the, the color of, 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 of honey, uh, it just depends on what flowers are in that area um, and, and what are plentiful. So I can't I can't tell you one over over the other. No. OK. How long does the pollination process take? And of course that uh, and Mr. Stanley and and and, and it, it 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 varies it it varies uh, because you've got a lot of factors that are coming in place whether it's uh, self pollination with that one particular plant or cross pollination where bees or insects are going from one plant to the other or the wind uh, so it it, uh, 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 it it depends on on a, a lot of factors uh, it's more than just a day. Uh, but when you have the, like, for example, the, the uh, bumblebees that are there at the plant uh, and, and it's flapping its wings, what I did not tell you, uh, although that's 130 uh, flaps per second, the honeybee actually does it even greater, uh, 100 and, about 170 uh, per, 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 I mean, it, it, it is just, it is just, it's just flapping. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to say how long that the pollination process takes. It, it, it varies. Yeah. Um, this uh, Susan wants to know about carpenter bees. I don't know that maybe you mentioned that. And, and so I, I, I did not I did not mention uh, carpenter bees. Uh, carpenter bees fall in, 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 the, in the same category with uh, their apidae. Um, but I. Uh, I don't see that many carpenter bees, and um, and 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 I have not. But they are. They certainly are. They are there, uh, a part of that of that of that of the order and and the family. And so it's 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 a regional thing. Uh, I'm not sure or whether there are a lot of carpenter bees in this area. Um, I can answer that. I yeah. have one on my porch right now. Do you really? Yes. It has uh, burrowed into the railing. The wooden <sighs> and, and that was what I was going to say. They, they, they have a, a sense of being able to, to burrow into things. Yes. I understand they're not dangerous, but no, uh, they, they come at you. Uh, uh, Yes, they you because you you see it flying and they head your way and, and so uh, they're scary, particularly because people who don't know bees in general just they talk. It's a bee, it's a bee, and if it's a bee, you think it's going to sting you. But they yeah. look like bumblebees, and 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 that is the and and that's a part of of uh, how they have been able to survive uh, because they do look like bumblebees, and so. Uh, others are afraid because they know what bumblebees will do. And so when you see the carpenter bee, uh, it gives the impression that it's a bumblebee. And so they've been able that that's what survival uh, based on looking like bumblebees. Mim mimicry. Yeah. Mimicry. You're, you are correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So you, you're welcome to come to my porch and meet meet my carpenter. Bee. <laughs> Look, if I come over, do, do you want me to get rid of them or what? No, <laughs> let's just see. Saying. No, <laughs> so watch him uh, do his thing or her certainly, thing. Certainly, certainly. I'll yeah. accept the invitation, Mr. Duff. Okay, great. Um, I've been attacked by several of the species you mentioned tonight, so I just want to say 
Uh, I went to Mississippi for a wedding and I got out of my car for five minutes on the side of the road and fire ants went up oh. the, up my leg and, and, and attacked me. <laughs> I don't know. I have this thing about uh, stinging insects. Uh, that they just <laughs> don't like me. And oh, the yellow jackets. Oh my. Yeah. But here's a question from Bart. What makes an egg laid by a queen bee become another queen versus a drone or a worker bee? Is it random or does this happen by known mechanism? And if so, what? So the the the, the queen actually uh, makes a determination. And so you've got, but you have drones that are assisting in, in the process. So the queen has to, uh, she, she and, and depending on how large the colony is, so the queen is 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 making is is having to make rounds uh, as well as, as as lay eggs. And so, uh, if you are a, a beekeeper, uh, you've got to be concerned uh, with your your hive that there's just one queen. And if you see another one developing, you've got to take care of that. Uh, if if th that other queen hasn't hasn't gotten there. And, and, and so the, the drones are there to help, to help uh, uh, develop uh, new queens, uh, particularly with, with honeybees, you've got, you've got to be very, very careful. If it's ants, you're not worried about that. Uh, but, but, with the, but with the honeybee, you, you, you really, unless you want to have problems, uh, because if you've got a couple of queens and, and, and they're, uh, it, it, it becomes problematic. Swarming might might take place, um, but the, the 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 queen the queen, depending on how large the the colony is, uh, tries to go and 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 make sure that she is the is the only one. But if it's a, a very large colony, uh, there's difficulty associated with that. And and if it's a huge colony, and she hasn't been in a particular area. For a, 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 a period of time, the drones now are, are doing their best to help with uh, making a new queen. Um, I read an article the other day about, I think it was Chicago, where a lot of the downtown areas that are now empty lots, they're putting in a lot of wildflowers to try to make them bee and butterfly gardens. I, I thought that's a great idea you know, since bees are a little bit threatened. And do you think it's something that could work here? Hmm. Of course it could. Uh, if, if and I, I guess the, the intent is the intent to have these beautiful flowers or is the intent to attract bees and have all of that downtown? That's the question. I and, think we, go ahead. Uh, according to the article, they were trying to uh, cultivate more bees to help them uh, sustain their populations and create honey and, and that sort of thing. So it was part of their sort of agricultural downtown efforts. I would be careful. I would be careful downtown. Uh, yeah. The concern is that it is downtown. And, and, and I guess once... Uh, the pandemic is over and you're going to have people moving, the, the movement itself. So if you, you've got bees downtown and you've got nests and hives and those kinds of things, uh, people just very not naively might just walk by or, or, or cause vibrations um, that, that the, the insects might feel as, uh, as being aggressive, causing alarm, and then they, they, they might attack. Uh, yeah. I would, I was watching uh, one of those parking war, the parking war series, and and it, it was either in Detroit or Philadelphia where a swarm had had, had come into town, and it was there, and it was causing a, a a lot of uneasiness for people downtown as they're walking because again, you've got these bees that are swarming, and all, although they're there temporarily for an hour, a few days. No one ever, who, who expects to see a, a beehive or a swarm downtown? So I, I would just right. be, be very careful uh, okay. of those risks. Good advice. Here's our last question, and then we'll, okay. we'll let you go. That's a good question for me because I, I don't know what to do. 
with the yellow jacket. So, so if if you're at an area, a picnic area, I would I would advise you uh, that that it that you you try to select an area that there isn't a trash can or a receptacle close by uh, to reduce the the yellow jackets coming. Uh, I would also make sure that it is an area that that, that I look under the, the tables and stuff, any surrounding trees or structures, again, to look and see that there, there are no hives or, or anything there. And then be, be, be very careful. Um, even as, as you are setting out, 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 out food, I would try things that are sweet. I, I wouldn't just set them out in the open and leave them there. Because they have those uh, the the chemo receptors that they will tune in on. Oh, I'm smelling it! I'm smelling it! And and and, and it will it will attract them. So I, I would I would be careful the area that I chose that there's not already garbage and and, and stuff there. Uh, try to an area that's, that's kind of clean and 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 look around to make sure you don't see any existing. Uh, bees that are there, and then just be careful with with what you're serving and putting it out there and leaving it in the open. Excellent, good advice. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, fascinating presentation. I know we could have gone on for a lot longer. Because <laughs> these purple insects are fascinating, aren't they? Yes, they 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 really are. They really are. But thank you for the opportunity, and I hope that what I shared has been beneficial uh, and meaningful. Very good. It was. And we're going to draw now our winners. First, for the Blanco Glass B Suncatcher, uh, which is a lovely item. And if you'll get in touch, if, if I call your name, just get in touch and I'll uh, send it to you. Uh, let's see. The winner of the B Suncatcher is Shamrico Stanley, who asked the question tonight. Congratulations, Mr. Stanley. And the winner of the World Wildlife Fund Adopt a Bee is Diane Evans. Oh, Diane Evans. Congratulations, Diane Evans. Wow. <laughs> Can't so, go wrong. Uh, She's an Evans. <laughs> <laughs> Good name. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Evans. Uh, remember, next week, Michael Strand... University of Georgia, we're going to talk about mosquitoes and flies. Not the most pleasant insects to most people, but they have both benefits and a lot of, uh, let's say, they have a dark side. And mosquitoes bother me too, by the way. <laughs> and then uh, Tuesday, uh, Emma Wiley will be here for Archiving Wheeling Presents. And you're getting lots of, of good comments, so I encourage you to go on the Facebook page of People's University and don't forget, people out there, Root PU, go to the library, take a picture with the giant cicada, and you can win some artwork. Okay, that's it, folks. Thanks for attending. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Goodbye.